So you're going to be flying with kids and you're worried it might be a little bit stressful. Well, in this video, I'm gonna share all of the top tips you absolutely need to know when flying with little ones on both long and short haul flights to make your life so much easier. If we've not met before, hi, I am Ree from mummyof4.com. As the name suggests, I have four children. And if you've seen my Mummy of Four Does Disney channel, you'll know that we enjoy traveling to Disney parks with the children and have taken many, many flights in the last few years. My children do have autism, so in this video I'm also going to be covering tips for flying with children with additional needs, but to be honest, most of these tips are going to apply to all children, whether neurotypical or neurodiverse, to make your flight fly by. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad, wasn't it? So the first one comes when you're booking flights, and it's just as simple as booking direct flights wherever possible. Although the idea of flying when you're a small child it might sound quite exciting, Practically, it's just a means of getting to your holiday and it can be a point of friction. So we can minimize flights and certainly the number of flights that we've got to take, it's going to be a lot easier. Now, often flying indirect can save quite a bit of money. So if this is a priority for you, then maybe it is something worth considering. But for us, for my children on the spectrum, I felt that taking indirect flights and multiple flights to get to a destination, specifically when we're traveling somewhere as far away as Florida, might just be enough to tip them over the edge and really spoil the first few days of the trip. So while you might be saving a few pounds by flying indirect, what impact is that gonna have on your holiday? It's just something worth considering. So if I was traveling on my own, I'd definitely consider indirect flights if they were significantly cheaper. But with my children, ugh, it does not sound appealing. Next, it's worth considering the time of day that you will be traveling and how well your children sleep while they are traveling. If you've got the kind of kids that can fall asleep as soon as you're on the move, then definitely look at booking a night flight. They'll sleep through the whole flight, which is basically like time travel, isn't it? And the whole thing will be a lot easier. If, however, you know you've got kids that are really resistant to sleeping while traveling, a night flight, meaning they're tired and still not sleeping, may not be the best of ideas. Well, I'm sure if we were lucky enough to fly in first class and have the lovely lie down beds, then sleeping on the flight would be pretty much quite easy. Budgeting requirements have meant that we've been traveling at the back of the plane with minimal space to sleep. And if I'm honest, my youngest, Zara, who is seven, has slept pretty well on flights. My middle two really do struggle a bit more with sleeping on planes, even when it is nighttime. So with that considered, night flights were not ideal for us as a family. This is to do with you knowing your own children and knowing how well they are likely to sleep while traveling. Next thing you need to do is book seats as early as possible. Now it is a guideline that children under the age of 12 should be sat near an adult, but this is not a law. So you need to look at your own airline's policy on this. So some airlines say that they would be within reaching distance of you as the responsible adult, and that could mean next to them, across an aisle, in front or behind you. Now I know my children wouldn't cope very well at all sitting next to strangers behind me or in front of me. So really they need to be next to myself or my husband while we're flying. Now over the last few years we've flown with Virgin, EasyJet and British Airways. And when we flew with British Airways, I actually didn't know about the special assistance that we could access. So I was just kind of panic booking the seats the day before when we were checking in and it was quite stressful. So we managed to get seats all together, but that wouldn't necessarily have been the case. With EasyJet, I'd learned about the special assistance. So I'd spoken to EasyJet customer services and they'd managed to book us seats together on the plane because the children had additional needs. They were able to do that for me. Same with Virgin, we managed to book the seats well in advance and it's well worth looking at the airplane map as you are booking the seats. So with British Airways, for example, they had three seats next to the window. When we were flying with Virgin this time, it was two seats next to the window and four seats or three seats in the middle. So I always sit with one of my girls either side with me, then my boys, my eldest two, will normally sit with my husband or it'll just be my middle one if my eldest isn't with us because he doesn't always travel with us, he's in university now. For the Virgin flight, I put myself and the girls in the middle on a three-seater and my husband and Will over by the window. We opted to go quite far back near the toilets because that way it's quite easy to access the toilets and to stand up and see if the toilets are available or if there's a queue. Because chances are, if you're flying long haul with kids, you're gonna be visiting the toilets quite a lot. There's quite a long walk to that toilet, then you don't know if they're occupied or not before you get up from your seats. It's a lot more of a faff. 
suited us well to sit a few rows down from the toilet. Where we were sitting, I could actually keep an eye on both the children sitting in the seats and the child in the toilet at the same time. It's definitely worth speaking to the airline that you've actually booked with for their specific policy on this, because they will all vary. Even if you're not tra traveling with anyone with additional needs, the when to book the seats policy and whether there'll be an additional charge to book seats or not will vary. So speak to them about your concerns at the time of booking the tickets. Insist you're going to need to be sitting with your children and see what they can do to help you. If it is a long drive to the airport, consider staying nearby the night before. So we live in Wales and when we fly to Florida, we fly from Heathrow, which is quite a long drive. If we were to drive to the airport on the day and then leave enough time to make sure we hadn't hit traffic, plus the flight, it would make it a really, really long day. And quite frankly, a 10 and a half hour flight, because that's what it was on the way to Florida, with the winds, plus all the time waiting around in the airport was a long enough day as it was. If you saw our travel day vlog, you'll know that we were all incredibly tired. But luckily we had stayed near the airport the night before. If however, you live closer to the airport, then by all means consider driving there, just leave in plenty of time that you're not hitting any traffic, make sure you've organized parking in advance, or do what we do, which is have airport transfers. This is ideal because quite often, especially if you've got a large family, you'd be allowed for example, on a transatlantic flight, one large check-in case each. We actually took medium-sized cases, although we would have been allowed to take larger ones, and one carry-on case each. Meaning for five of us, we had 10 cases. That wouldn't have physically fit in our car, so airport transfers were the obvious solution. Plus, I've gotta admit, on the way back, I was so tired. I almost felt drunk, even though I hadn't been drinking. So I feel like, Flying and then driving back would have been about as safe as drunk driving and I would not have recommended it. So you need to think about staying up the night before, if you're far enough away, and then also how you're gonna to get to the airport. Will it be airport transfers? Will you be driving? Will you be having a lift? All these things are worth considering. So then we need to get into the planning for the trip and the flight. Make lists of absolutely everything you're going to need and we're gonna go through what those things are in a second. If you are doing Disney trips, then I have Magical Trip and Magical Cruise Planners, which help you plan out all of the things you're going to need to pack. And I am working on a non-Disney version of my holiday planners. So watch this space, join my email club um, by using the details below. When you, when you join that, there is a packing list and things in there that you get as a freebie in with my ultimate man bundle of free printables. So there will be some resources in there to help you anyway. But if you are in that email club, then you'll be the first to hear it when my holiday planners go live. So if your children have autism, I'd say this next step is essential. But quite frankly, even if they're neurotypical children, meaning they don't have autism, I'd say this next step would help all children. And that is preparing them for the process that you're going to face, arriving at the airport, going through security and getting on the plane and flying. I'm sure for adults and children alike, the more familiar they are with what they're going to face, the less they're gonna be thrown off and be upset. If your children are very little, Peppa Pig is always a great way to explain most things to them. There's a Peppa Pig episode where they go to the airport, they put their bags through security, and then they get on the plane. And if your children are very small, that's probably a great episode to show them. If your children are that little bit older, then you can check out vlogs. In my travel day vlogs, I always try and include everything step by step that we have to do, including how long it takes to get through various elements in the terminal, how long it takes to get through security, just everything you as a parent will need to know and everything a child will need to know just to know what to expect. If you've flown before, you can show your children video clips or photos of them on a previous flight and definitely take some video clips and photos on this flight to show them for future trips. So a few things you're gonna to want to be packing. One of them is spare clothes for your children. Layers are a really good idea on flights because sometimes it can be very warm, sometimes it can be very cold, and you just kind of don't know until you're in the airport and then you're on the plane. And to be honest, as we travel, we're layering up and stripping things off throughout the day. It's also worth having spares in case of accidents or spillages. There's nothing worse than having to travel in clothes covered in any sort of bodily fluid. One of my children was sick on the flight home on the last trips. So you never know when that's gonna happen. She was literally fine seconds later, but then it was sick everywhere. There was a spillage on another flight. So it's just worth having spare clothes, just leggings, t-shirt, pants, socks for your children, maybe a spare jumper or hoodie in your hand luggage, cause you never know. And traveling all gunky or wet or worse, is not fun for anyone. Make sure you've got enough activities to keep your kiddos happy. 
So if there's ever a time for screen time, it's probably while you're on a flight. Make sure any devices are updated, charged up, all the downloads are properly working. For some things like Netflix and Disney Plus, sometimes you've got to go back in and reactivate downloads. Make sure you've done this before your flight because you do not want to be getting on the flight and they think they've got a tablet full of stuff to watch and they haven't. Make sure you've got appropriate charger wires, headphones, all that kind of stuff ready to go as well as the usual colouring pens, activity books, that kind of thing. Whether you're heading to Disney or not, I have got videos about what I took for carry-on for my children on my Mummy of Four Does Disney channel. I will link those videos below. They might be quite helpful for ideas of what to pack for carry-on for your own kids. It is worth taking snacks for the flight. Now, if you're going on short hop, more budget airlines, like when we went to EasyJet, you can buy snacks on board. And if you're traveling with BA or Virgin Transatlantic, then they'll likely be offering food as a complimentary included in your ticket kind of thing. Not all of the food on board is necessarily going to be to your children's liking. And obviously there's no way you can go to get any other food if there is a problem. So it's well worth packing some snacks that you know they're going to eat in a pinch. You're going to want to take drinks bottles. Obviously these are gonna to have to be emptied to go through security, but as soon as you clear security, there's always somewhere to fill up water bottles. Because I don't know about you, I always feel like I feel really dehydrated coming off a flight. I know when I got off the flight to Florida, I'd managed to drink all of my water and I was absolutely parched and just desperate for more water. So make sure you've got those water bottles and that you fill them up. What I should have done, just before we landed in Florida, was ask the flight crew to fill up my water bottles for us, which they absolutely would have done. They were fantastic. More about that in a second. Think about comfortable clothing, both for you and your kids. We thought about spares, but what are you actually going to wear? Make sure you've got comfortable shoes because you might be walking quite a long way through the airport. We wore Skechers for our last Florida trip and everyone got on really, really well with them. They were really, really comfortable. Leggings, t-shirts, nothing that's gonna dig in on the flight. And like I said before, layers, layers, layers to layer up and strip off with the temperature fluctuating in various areas of the airport or on the plane. They're also going to need any comfort items that they rely on for my children or for the girls at least. It would be their bunnies, they absolutely adore. Anything that is gonna make them a little bit more comfortable, happier, if they are feeling a little bit worried or if they do want to go to sleep. Neck pillows can be a really good idea. I always pack them for the children and never for myself. And then I always regret my life choices, but I <laughs> kind of think I'm sacrificing the room in the case so we can put some other stuff in rather than taking my own neck pillow. But the children love flying with their neck pillows. And to be honest, I guess I could do the same for my own. They can be clipped on the outside of bags if there is an issue with not being able to fit them in the case. So back to your devices. We need to make sure they're updated. It's well worth taking charger packs so that any devices can be charged as they go flat. Make sure you've got cables for each device because often there are USB ports on the plane that you can utilize. Make sure you've downloaded the videos, like I said earlier, but also think about some games. These could be educational games. They could be mindless games, just something to keep them busy. But then also audiobooks can be absolutely fantastic on flights. My girls really like having audiobooks to help them fall asleep, especially if you slow down the pace of the audiobook to 75%. It makes it sound very sleepy. So audiobooks are a really, really good idea too. And for my youngest at least, over the head headphones work because they work as a little bit of an ear defender as well as a means to actually listen to devices. So special assistance at the airport. This is not something I knew about when we flew to Florida with the children. However, we discovered it during our Paris trips. We were given sunflower lanyards to utilize and this is a universal system that is recognized by various airports. And it just means that that person struggles with queuing for whatever reasons. This could be autism, anxiety, or a number of other things. The sunflower lanyards meant that we didn't have to stand in queues with the children for things like passport control or security. While there was an element of having to wait around in certain areas of the airport, we certainly got to skip the bulk of the queue, which was fantastic because my children really don't do well with queuing. You can get the sunflower lanyards in advance of your trip. They can be purchased online or just visit the special assistance desk when you get to the airport in question. You can phone ahead if you want to hear the specific policies from each airport, but generally just look for the special assistance desk when you arrive. That will be an airport wide thing. It meant that the children were able to board the plane first before the rush and get off the plane last, which is much, much easier. 
but even if you haven't got children with additional needs, if you're traveling with children, you'll often be invited to board the plane first before the rush. Just don't be afraid to ask for help. As long as you're polite, people are generally very willing to be helpful. So as you're traveling, you can make the whole thing go a lot smoother by making sure you're not flustered. So this includes having things like both printed and digital versions of all of your travel documents to hand. Because let's face it, if you're stressed, you can't find things, the children are gonna be stressed, the whole trip's gonna be unpleasant. So I save everything on a folder in my phone and I also have printed out copies in my hand luggage too. It's just great for peace of mind in case my phone was randomly going to decide to turn off and not come back on. For the last trip, I actually put our passports in a belt bag across my chest, which was so much easier because you actually need to get your passports in and out and in and out quite a lot. Previously, they've just been in larger bags we've been carrying around, but I can recommend having a belt bag nice and close to your chest. You know where the passports are because if you're anything like me, you're like, la 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 la, oh, have I got the passports? Check. Yep, yeah, fine. Walking along a bit further. Oh, have I got the passports? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's just nice to have them somewhere they can be checked frequently. So when you get to security, obviously you're going to need to keep your liquids under 100 millilitres. So make sure this is all done in advance. And when you get to security, everything is already pre-packed. I would suggest having everything that's going to be a problem that needs to be opened up and shown in security all in one place, or maybe at least two places. Perhaps you don't want your liquids in with your electronics, but maybe you have all your liquids in one sealed bag in one place, and then perhaps in another bag you have all your electronics. So for me, this is quite a lot because obviously I travel with my laptop, iPad, camera gear, all that kind of stuff. And all that needs to come out to be shown at security. But by having all of that in one bag and putting that bag through last, it made it much simpler. So the way we work at the security, I send my husband through first to catch the non-problematic bags that don't need to be opened. I send the children through to meet him. And then I put the final bag through with all of the stuff I've taken out and then I go through the security scanner last to meet my family. Now, we do it this way around because obviously if you're sending open cases of laptops and things through first and then there are any issues, then you've got all of your stuff just out for anyone to grab the other side, which can be a bit worrying. So doing it this way around seems to be the least stressful. Once or twice, the scanners have gone off randomly, even though we've taken off all watches and devices and stuff. This can be upsetting for children. I know one of my daughters was scanned, she was quite upset. The airport staff were ever so nice and I said, look, okay, mummy's here with you, it's not a problem. They wanted to go and stand in the big scanning machine, which I've had to go and stand in a couple of times as well. And she wasn't happy at all, so they did the waving the wand over her and then that was all fine. I think explaining to the children in advance that these things could potentially happen, it's not a big deal. So everybody's being checked so that everyone can be kept safe can really help. Explaining to your kids that these things can happen in advance can really help in the event that they actually get stopped and scanned. Make sure you pack something for your children to eat or suck on during landing. This can be especially problematic if your children are very little, they don't know how to swallow or hold their nose and blow it to clear their ears when the pressure's changing, which can happen during takeoff, but we've always found it's much more problematic during landing. If they've got a sweet to suck on or a drink to drink, that swallowing action can really help to clear their ears. Obviously, if you've got a small baby, then you're not going to be able to get them to do this. So this could be quite painful for them, but feeding them and encouraging them to do that swallowing action can help. Make sure you've got transfers or transport organized on both sides. Now we've always done this. We did have a slight hiccup if you watch my latest Florida travel day vlog over on my Mummy and Paul Does Disney channel, where we got off the aeroplane and the transfer that had been organized for us just wasn't there. Now, luckily we went to the Mears Connect, which is like a big company in Florida. They had a desk, a permanent desk there, and we had a plan B to get us to our hotel resort, which was very much needed as we were very, very tired after the long flight. So even if you've got transfers organized, it's probably worth having a phone number on the name of a company or the location of somewhere you can go if for some reason your airport transfer doesn't show up. I'll definitely be researching backups from now on after that experience. Because tired children and a no airport transfer at the end of a long day was no fun at all. And perhaps one of my top tips would be to just be very polite and befriend the crew. So this might seem like a bit of an obvious one to just be nice to the people looking after you, but having observed other people on flights when we've been flying, then not everyone seems to take advantage of this. Remember that these people are there primarily for your safety, but also to take care of you. And by being especially nice and warm and welcoming and open, 
you're just going to receive a much better service. So whenever we get on the flight, I'll always explain to the flight crew looking after us that the children have the, the sunflower lanyards. It's possible I may have to ask them for some extra assistance at some point, kind of pre-warn them of that. My children made up little goodie bags. The girls had made bracelets because we were on our way to Disney and they were to give out to people that we met there and nice cast members, which is what Disney calls their staff, that were looking after us. So they gave some of those out on the flight and all of the flight crew were just so sweet and so lovely. They made such a lovely fuss of the children and they said it had been an absolute joy to have us on board and the time on the flight had flown by, so to speak. Now I know I've had messages from other people saying that they didn't have such good experience with the same airline. They felt that flight crew had witnessed the children struggling and still not intervened. But I think ultimately as a parent, it might feel really difficult and awkward, but the flight crew have got hundreds of people to look after. And if you're not, you know, very politely saying, look, I'm gonna need some help here, please. Then it might be quite easy to overlook any problems in a sea of faces. So don't be afraid to say like, hi, just introduce yourself and introduce your children and just pre-warn them that you might need a little bit of extra help. And personally, as we've had such amazing service on various flights and Disney trips and things we've been on the last few years, I always find it's nice to have what we call pixie dust to give to people that have really taken good care of us and to really give back a little bit for those people that have gone the extra mile to look after us. So maybe think about getting your kids to make some bracelets as thank yous, pack some little sweets, especially if you're flying to a different country. For example, when we were on the cruise ships, we always take Percy Pig sweets from Marks and Spencer because it's something that they can't get there. So certainly if you're flying with an airline that is not from the UK, then maybe the flight crew wouldn't be able to get UK specific sweets. That might be a nice little treat of something to leave them as a thank you. So obviously when flying with kids, there are so many challenges that you're going to potentially face. However, by planning ahead, making sure you've got your seats, making sure you've got the children prepared, making sure you're wearing comfortable clothes, you've got the spares, you've got all the snacks, you've got all the activities, it's just going to minimise any difficulties and hopefully make the flight as pleasant for everyone involved as possible. Thanks so much for watching. There is another video on screen that you may find helpful. Check out my latest release video and check out my Patreon if you want some early release content too. See you guys soon. Bye.